Okay. Okay, well, I'm really excited about what's happening this morning. We've got a very special speaker, Hansel uh, Barn or something, and uh, from the university, and uh, talking about this special project about deaf space, and, and it's an exciting project. So he's going to talk to you more about it. I'm looking forward to it and how we can apply it to SDA. Uh, also, you know, how it can apply in general to the federal agencies and how we can just provide it as a special accommodation. Thank you very much for being here. Take it away. <clears throat> so, um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Hansel Bauman. I'm the uh, um, campus architect for Gallaudet University and also the director of the Deaf Space Institute. Um, what I want to do today is uh, try to give you kind of the full range of what deaf space is and where it kind of came from, um, and then look at what this means in terms of both design standards, or really more like design guidelines that we've developed so far, as well as talk about design process, um, and then give you a, a case study that I think will be fairly relevant to what you might be interested here in terms of office environments. <laughs> Um, in an agency uh, like USDA. Um, I think <clears throat> one of the things, in some ways, deaf space uh, is, as an architect, of which I am, and also a hearing architect, uh, it's pretty incredible to see what potential deaf space holds for, I think, honestly, a radical change in how architects go about doing the work and how they think about uh, what they do every day. And I'm, I'll point out a little more what I mean by that. To that point, I want to start in a kind of a different place rather than worrying about sort of measured standards. I'd like to start with a quote that um, was brought to me by the deaf community, a quote of Le Cabousier, a famous sort of father of, of modernist architecture, saying that <clears throat> occupancy of space is the first proof of existence. What's important about that is Throughout history, deaf people have been largely marginalized in this country. Um, the deaf community grew up mostly in residential homes. Those homes were largely set on the outside of town, and there was a large separation not only through language and communication access, but also spatially. And were disempowered in terms of uh, creating and molding their own space. <clears throat> if you're deaf, you relate to space very differently. So having that spatial separation, plus not necessarily being in control of your space, really is a disabling kind of experience that, to me, what's fascinating is the ways in which deaf people have strategized to get through that in any case. And that's what we want to talk about a little bit. The other quote is this, that people from different cultures not only speak different languages, but inhabit different sensory worlds. Uh, this was a quote by Edward Hall, um, a groundbreaking anthropologist who looked at cultural differences. And why this is important to us today is really, deaf space is not so much about accessibility per se, but also is about culture and cultural expression. And that's where empowerment for deaf people comes from, is this idea that there's a way of building a world around you that reinforces uh, a way of being in the world that's what we like to say is just a sensory difference. It's not a disability, but rather another uh, way of, of being in the world that contributes to human diversity. <clears throat> I first came into deaf space quite by accident. Um, Ten years ago, uh, I was invited to facilitate a workshop at Gallaudet uh, that was uh, led by uh, about 15 deaf uh, leaders and visionaries at Gallaudet who envisioned what would it be if we actually built our next new building in a way that really did fit our ways of being, a way we call deaf space. And what they did, I don't know how many of you have seen the Gallaudet campus. It's on the National Historic Registrar. It's a fine example of uh, Victorian Gothic architecture. The campus was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who is really the father of American uh, landscape architecture. Uh, Vox and Withers designed the buildings. Uh, so they went to the very best to design uh, their buildings. Uh, this plan was done in 1866. So it was a model campus in many ways. For the, specifically for the deaf community. 
The charter for the university was signed by Lincoln, and it was in 1864 for the sole purpose of educating deaf students in American Sign Language. It's continued with that mission for 150 years now. So it's very much about deaf culture. It is the cultural center in the world for uh, the deaf community in many ways. So they wanted to get the very best. But interestingly enough, if you look at other buildings Vox and Withers did on the Harvard campus, uh, the Memorial Hall, you can see a, a striking similarity. So while there was good intentions here, there was not really recognition that deaf people would have a sensibility that generates a different kind of architecture. With that in mind, this group of uh, faculty and uh, students got together and for two days we worked together to redesign or imagine their new building, which was the Sorensen Language and Communication Center building, which housed all of the language and communication programs plus the, uh, the hearing and speech uh, clinic. Uh, Outcomes from that workshop created what we call a cognitive map, the sort of cartoon sketch of experience. This was fundamentally a different way to start a project. It's not so much about what are the needs, but what is the experience we want to have in that building. <clears throat> That's real, literally a kind of map of experience going through the central space. Um, their ideas, I, with short of time, um, really the main things they had talked about is expressing deaf culture, having a connection to landscape, having visual connections so you can always see one another and be aware of where other people are so you know them visually. It had to do with uh, creating places that you could sense the movement of others as well as have comfortable place to sign and to see sign language and communicate comfortably visually. That sketch eventually over the next two years as it went through designed by the Smith Group architects evolved into the building you see here. You can see many of those ideas in terms of the large open spaces full of natural light. Things, some details like the, uh, the glass um, uh, guardrail here allows for visual communication which would all otherwise be barriers. And I'll talk a little bit more about these but this was really where the idea of creating a deaf space came from. When we went through that process, what we realized is actually the whole campus was really in stark contrast to deaf accessibilities. And the way what we did is we had gone through the next six years of a research project teaching a class and using students to really identify those parts of the campus that were not meeting their needs, that were barriers to either communication or visual access, be you walking or moving through space or seated in a classroom. What were those uh, barriers and how could we get rid of those? So through that work we realized that there's about three main categories of ways in which deaf experience interacts with, uh, with architecture or could form architecture. One of the areas, visual language, the fact that the language takes place in space and, and is kinetic immediately gives it sort of imp, uh, implications for architecture. Sensory reach, if you can't hear, then how do you understand the world 360 degrees around you? And this is a significant impact on architecture. And then finally <clears throat> is the collectivist culture of deaf culture. The idea that I've certainly heard for 10 years this idea is, is uh, deaf culture self-identifies as a collectivist culture, a culture that fends for itself, that is really about caring for one another, about pooling resources, and having a clear distinction of who's in and who's not in the culture. That too also has a lot to say about architectural expression. So I'll take you through each one of those three and just give you a, a kind of taste of what, that, what we mean by that. The images I'm going to share with you are from the design guidelines that we've put together. And <clears throat> we're now working on the second generation of these guidelines to give them a lot more measurability than we've been able to do in the past. So the basic building block for uh, visual language is this idea that in space, that the language takes place in space and you need distance between one another to see the language and that the language has a footprint or a pattern that it occupies within space. 
that sets up a different sort of metrics around how you might sit together. You can see right now we're in a kind of semicircle. That is probably one of the most common kind of patterns of deaf gatherings that there is. You can see that it's really based on triangular uh, layers of triangles, of being able to have direct communication. And the more people, you know, two people becomes a line, three people becomes a triangle, four, yet another triangle, until you get so many it really becomes sort of a, a circle. And you kind of see that uh, idea of, of um, how that, the footprint that larger conversations take on. So you, you get a sense of what that might mean spatially if you just look at simple comparisons of a kind of traditional hearing meeting taking place on a um, long, narrow conference table, kind of a traditional conference table, versus what you might do in a deaf environment with the sort of ho horseshoe shape. The result of that, on our campus, in a classroom on any other university, you might fit, say, 30 students in. We, we're lucky to pack about 16, 15 to 16 students into because of the, the added need for that, that spatial kind of uh, connectivity. That's also true in walking. So when, when one is mobile and communicating, sidewalks, the width of sidewalks is a really fundamental metrics for allowing people to maintain sign language maintain a comfortable conversation, and yet keep walking. On our campus, we have most of the sidewalks are about as half as wide as they should be. So each time we improve them, we try to double their width. So you see here. And then the other thing is keeping that walkway clear of barriers. So keeping things like light poles and fire hydrants and bollards and signage and seating, all this stuff that landscape architects and architects tend to just kind of carelessly set down in that path are then set off to the side. And we're trying to create strategies we call shoulder zones as a way to set those elements off to the side. Sidewalks having a, a warning strip to either side to allow underfoot texture sort of warning that you're ed at the edge of that path. Um, pathways, again, internally in buildings, looking at um, some things like, such as drinking fountains, would be set into alcoves so that you could actually have a peripheral view of people moving by you, but you've stepped out of the path. Front doors, uh, main entries into our buildings were transitioning to use of uh, sliders, so double uh, leaf sliders, so that they're on uh, electrical uh, contacts or detectors, so that when you arrive to the building, you can continue your conversation. You don't stop the conversation, open the door, and then go in. You're allowed to kind of continue your conversation as you go in. The issue of lighting is very important uh, to see sign language. Um, one of the biggest uh, detractors to concentration is eye fatigue. So if you sit and you have, uh, you watch uh, sign language um, for an hour's class and the lighting is poor, you see a lot of shadow or backlighting, it really begins to uh, cause eye fatigue and then detract attention as well as just become sort of a source of, uh, of headaches and the like. Um, in fact, there's probably an Excellent example of, of a bad lighting condition uh, that we have right now. Um, you'll see right behind the interpreter, there's these mini blinds. Mini blinds tend to, as you'll notice, will have a little bit of, of light coming between the blades. That high contrast between that little bit of light and that dark blade over time will start to vibrate. So if you need to, the interpreter to kind of find another place, let us know, because that'll drive me nuts watching it. So that's a, a really good example of that historically has never really been thought about before. So just some very subtle moves in the environment can really significantly improve the reading of sign language. 
we very much uh, we found a, a real um, sort of ideal lighting condition is that a really good uh, diffuse light light brought in from multiple sources within a room or use of light shelves that allow light source or layers of light from multiple directions that means that you've got light kind of shining up on the face as well as from multiple directions so it tends to do away with the shadows that can be distracting for those of you who don't use ASL so much of it takes place on the face so there's a lot of expression a lot of syntax is read on the face it's not just hand gesture but it's the kind of full experience that uh, the lighting allows you to experience with a greater degree of clarity I think we did that finally the issue of color uh, also helps provide a perceptually calm environment uh, we looking uh, often use uh, hues of blue that aren't too dissimilar than what's in this room we tend to use a darker blue with a gray in it that provides a really nice contrast to a, a full range of, of skin tones um, that contrast as to a lot of clarity when you see both sign language and that's true really uh, largely for people who have low visions or usher syndrome which is a uh, uh, there's an onset of usher syndrome that goes along with a deaf experience or or is a cause of deafness that's fairly prevalent and we see that more and more in institutions uh, serving deaf communities so sensory reach kind of that second category um, I just call attention to the diagram of how we're thinking about sensory reach is to understand that world 360 degrees but yet you're maybe only living in that per that peripheral view there's about 180 degrees that that a lot of us who are hearing depend on the hearing to kind of give us that information so we're looking at strategies and architecture that can help give you information about what's happening behind you or around you in other rooms that you cannot hear from but allow uh, you to connect to those spaces so there's transparency reflection vibration and then also what we called sen shared sensory reach shared sensory reach is a particularly interesting one because what that depends on remember I talked about the collectivist deaf culture this is an important one because it's about sh the looking at, at the actions of others being aware of what others are doing also gives cues as to what else is happening in the space that you may not be able to, to sense uh, auditorily. So how do architecture can help um, provide you a sense of space as well as wayfinding, knowing where you are in space. Here's a few diagrams of looking at the organization of buildings and spaces within buildings, sort of diagrams that look at the ability to have view corridors, to sense space beyond other buildings, and that might even apply to landscape and how you might structure landscape so that vegetation frames views to special destinations you might have interior spaces a hierarchy of public space to private space diagram looking at these these red points as destination points so that they're easily read upon arriving within uh, a building and then finally looking at that uh, opening up floors so you have a visual kind of connection vertically in the building as well one of the <clears throat> ones that we have used started to use quite a lot is this idea of the soft intersections so a building like this where you have a lot of long corridors that meet each other uh, we've noticed we we saw a lot of incidences in our academic buildings where students will be walking along and not unaware of who's coming around the corner there's a collision that takes place there spilled coffee and books and whatnot so we're starting to look at either curving corners or putting glass panels in corners so that you sense people who are coming down the hallway um, without even <clears throat> without the need to hear their footfall there's also this idea of transparency you know a lot of it's very popular now to have glass in offices and on one hand in deaf space it's really desirable to be able to see who's approaching you from the hallway but on the other hand if you see sign language and you have you're sitting in an office having a private conversation 
with an all-glass wall, there's no privacy. So there's these conflicts that we're trying to work out. And a lot of the way we can control that is through the use of different kinds of opacity in the glass. So you sense the movement of others, but not necessarily see the detail that it might take to see a conversation. Sort of similar ideas of, of reflective surfaces. And we don't, we're not suggesting to put mirrors up in a building. We're suggesting being mindful of the kinds of materials that you might use that are finished materials within a building that would suggest, uh, begin to suggest shadow or um, reflections, be it in pictures or <clears throat> countertops or any of the surfaces you might use, strategically place can help give a reflection so that you know and can monitor the movement of people uh, within the space. We <clears throat> We're big proponents of looking at how you can strategically use color to aid in wayfinding or to define space within space. Uh, we've used this in our new dormitory uh, on campus, strategies such as this to where rooms could be identified uh, with a color patch as well as room numbers uh, to give aid in visual wayfinding. And that that would be a system that might be alive throughout a building. It's very sort of Basic idea, you see this used a lot in parking garages, but we find they're very helpful uh, in larger buildings, again, much like the one that you're in, for visual wayfinding. Another, this to me is sort of a surprising one. Um, we're looking at uh, people who are walking and signing are not necessarily watching where they're going. So, you know, those of us in the hearing world will sort of walk along together and be chatting and watching where we're going, and all's fine. In the deaf world, if you're, or in the signing world, if you're looking at signing, you're actually, your head's in one direction. You're not looking this way, you're looking this way. So what that means is, and we've done some studies about this, where that is what information I'm receiving visually but I'm moving forward this way. So what ends up happening in the collectivist culture of deaf community is my partner is looking out for me and I'm looking out for them. So, you know, we're starting to look at, ask this question, how can the building participate in that sort of caring for one another as you walk and talk? And one of the ways that we found, particularly working with people with low vision, is the use of either, um, horizontal datums or color changes in the wall high, and then also at the base that allows a kind of visual cue as to the movement of the shape of the space. And again, this is very helpful for people with, with low vision who oftentimes the condition tends to flatten out the change between a wall and a floor. So having those stark color contrasts gives cues as to the change of that, that shape. Same is true with columns on the front of a building that you can use visually, can use those, uh, those columns or that rhythm as a way to sort of hold you in space. And we've, we've actually done some interesting studies of watching uh, signers, uh, how they, their, their movement as they go by colonnaded buildings versus open uh, plazas. And you can see a very radically different path taken. Next to or within the colonnade is a fairly straight path. And then getting out into these open spaces, you tend to, you can see a kind of a meandering taking place as sort of finding the way. Also then using light to shape the space. Again, you know, this is nothing novel particularly. Lighting designers are always playing with levels of light, color of light, temperature of light. But we'd like to look at, say, that that is a, a resource that we have to identify spaces that you might pull off and have conversations versus open space or larger collective spaces. I'm not sure if you have these here in your offices, but it's very common uh, in buildings that are designed specifically for deaf people to have a visual doorbell. So since you can't hear the knock on the door, uh, a light within the room is illuminated when the doorbell is struck. Um, that works fairly well, but what we end up finding happening is if there's no transparency here, either in the door or a side light or a transom, 
This person has no idea if the signal's been received or not. Is the light working? No one's in there? And you just see people kind of hitting the button and hitting the button and kind of, there's not a feedback that we're used to having as hearing people. We immediately, you hear the doorbell inside, so there's an awareness of, I've made contact. They're, no one's coming to the door, they either don't want to come, or they're not there. So what we're starting to look at here is organizing that light inside the office with the transom so that there's that kind of feedback and understanding of what's happening in, in the other, other room. So finally, looking at deaf culture, uh, this idea of the collectivist culture, uh, the buildings that we look at all are based on some kind of basic principles, one of which is at the core of the buildings is a collective space, a space in which you enter and then move out of or move through to move to other spaces within the building. And I'll show an example of that here in a moment. Also, this idea of being able to see from corridors or movement paths into other offices, having a sense of other people being around is a reassuring, um, is a reassuring notion that I am here. So again, you compare this to what we have in the hearing world as an experience of what's self-validating for me is as I'm talking to you right now, I can hear myself talk. If you don't have that sort of feedback, that validation of being, it's incredibly, incredibly uh, disconcerting. And we know this from studies that have been done from people who have sudden hearing loss, where anxiety, the highest level of anxiety comes from this idea of, am I here, am I here, I can't hear myself, am I here? So what we're starting to, we've done some studies, Robert Servage, who uh, has worked with us for a number of years, a deaf fellow who's also going blind, has done a lot of uh, research into this idea of of what he calls figure eight, or this feedback loop of being able to have visual connection, where in signing, if you're signing, what I'm depending on all of you for my validation is that you're recognizing me, that, you know, that there's eye contact happening in that conversation. So how can architecture begin to kind of reinforce this idea of visual feedback is something that we're also looking in, and right now, kind of at the early dumb stages we're at right now, this idea of being aware of others uh, is getting a lot of positive feedback from people who use buildings with those kind of transparencies in it. There's also having your, dis your work on display or artifacts about deaf history that are reinforcing about who you are and identity is a very important part of, uh, of reinforcing culture. And that even goes to light. In deaf culture, there's this idea of we are the people of the light. So having light as a real deep connection to at night, where do you gather, where do you find deaf people, you always find them in the light. And so we're looking at ways to take that kind of cultural uh, mantra and sort of sculpt light on our campus as a way to reinforce that idea. And then, then you know, just kind of in creating spaces that really uh, play with light, that play with that connection of, uh, to nature through the use of colored light to where you'd see the swing of the day, morning, midday, and evening. So I'll just quickly show you um, all of those that I've just shared with you are just a snippet of what our group of students did through uh, over about five years worth of work investigating every inch of the campus of what's friendly or supportive of deaf experience or not. Um, they also conducted, uh, once they discovered or identified what didn't work on campus, they went through a series of, of design exercises um, and came up with solutions, a lot of which were the result of what's in the book. Whoops. Um, there was, you know, I think a kind of qualitative study that we've taken uh, looking at deaf walks. This is an image you see of, uh, we equipped GoPro cameras on interlopers' heads, both for hearing and deaf, and mapped, uh, you know, what are they actually looking at. The pair you see here, the image on the left is one person, and here's the other person. This is taken at the same moment in time, and you can see that there's not a focus, a shared focus on the sidewalk. 
to deaf people walking here. We also began to sort of map how footfall would take place between and compare the differences there, using that as a way to try to understand how you might design facades of buildings and then also surfaces of sidewalks to encourage greater connection to the environment. Uh, one group of students studied the conversation circle in our main cafeteria area, looking, trying to change the furniture and seeing if furniture guided the shape in which people sat. Typically, there's round tables. These students took out all the furniture and replaced them with square tables, and you begin to get a sense of the natural making of that circle in the seating. That plus looking at chairs, uh, based on this research, we've completely changed all of the furniture in the space, particularly chairs opting from the heavy, awkward ones to the lighter, more mobile ones that allow you to sit in multiple ways, even turn around the chair and sit on it backwards. We're getting a lot better reading from students about the comfortability and the amount of time that they spend in the cafeteria socializing. We've been working with uh, an artist at MIT looking at ways to use vibration as a means to uh, communicate um, signals through the building. Um, and then process, because so much of this is coming from an organic approach, this isn't a top-down sort of scientist saying this what must be. This is organic. It's, it's about the deaf community expressing who they are and, and what their desires are. <coughs> so with that means design processes should inherently really include the user. So we're very much promoting the idea of user inclusion in the design process. I showed you the, the SLCC building earlier as kind of our first uh, deaf space uh, project. And, you know, that was the first one we've ever done. Um, we had uh, a lot of lessons learned. We made a lot of mistakes. We made some successes. And we wanted to understand why did we make those mistakes? Where, where did we go wrong? And I think there's a lot of answers to that. But I think fundamentally one of them is, is the way in which we engage the deaf community. That first workshop, we had a real peak of engagement. The, the image you see here is a, is a kind of a conceptual graph that's looking at the contact hours that we had with community members. And then this is the design process along the horizontal axis. You see a design phase. We bid the job, and then we built the project. For this project, in that design phase, we had a high level of engagement. We had a lot of people weighing in in those design uh, charrettes. Then they kind of went away. We learned what we learned, and they went away. And the architect sat down with the building committee and started making a lot of detailed design decisions and a lot of decisions about budget. So how can we afford all that we've been asked to give, put into this by the deaf community? So those formative decisions about detailed design and cost all took place as the engagement dropped. So you start to see design changes. The empowerment that was intended to take place really disintegrated as, as the process went on. So we felt like as these primary form-giving decisions, when you make decisions about budget, you're changing the design. So a lot of the ideas that were proposed here were done away with here. So we wanted to change that process in the next building we did. This is our uh, more recent uh, completed building, a dormitory. Um, we set up a design competition that forced architects to be at the table and be listening to the users all the way through a costing process. We had four teams. They had to be awarded a design build project, so they had to be awarded on both a, um, the project amount had to be uh, demonstrated that it was going to be on budget and that had to have contractors back up for that as well as meet the design criteria. That graph looks something like this. Not only was it higher amount of engagement, you can see we tended to have more engagement over time, but the significant difference is where dollars were talked about, where budget was talked about. Because it was design build, all of the users had to participate in that decision making about being on budget. So that and what we also had to do is get into more detailed decision making about materials, 
about color, about shapes of space. All of those detailed decisions were really brought forward in, in the design process. So you see those two graphs sort of compared to one another between the SLC, or the more recent building, and then the older SLCC building. So it's not just about the ideas, but it's also about how you implement them. This space is, is a, uh, the terrace lounge. It's, it's terraced, terraced to meet the, the natural topography of the ground. But the idea of terracing that space came from the deaf community because this team who won the competition were really excellent listeners. And they, they came to us and they said about halfway through the competition, they said, you know what, you can't afford the building you've asked for. Don't know how to do it. The other teams did not, interestingly enough, do that. Somehow theirs were magically on budget. So throughout this conversation, the deaf, uh, our three deaf students said, wait a minute, let's take some of the conference rooms, put them in the main sort of lounge area, use that stepping to define spaces within spaces. So on one hand, you can use that space as small gathering areas that meet a lot of the, the deaf space criteria or a large meeting area. And we've got really excellent sight lines in there. You can see that crowd of, of about 200 people watching Ben Bahan give a presentation, you didn't see heads move at all. They weren't struggling for some kind of view angle, but were just spot on. So that kind of space came through that process and I think is a, is a real example of success. We started to apply those. Um, this is a, a model from a recent classroom we've done. So you begin to see in this image that seating, that circle, kind of standard seating there. Um, you know, we play with that, that circle as such a critical kind of thing. What is, what that geometry is. In a, in a classroom, what tends to happen is a teacher will want to relate to the students. So they, their, their positioning will tend to go into the, into the space to try to, make connection with students, particularly if you have a really deep sort of U shape. But what that does, you see the interpreter over here, now you're left out of the conversation. You have no idea what I'm saying. We've done some studies that have looked at students and, and tracked seating locations with grade performance. And we, we noticed that the students who tend to not want to engage and tend to have lower grades sit on the extremities. And the better students tend to sit in the middle. So what we've been trying to look at is how do you shallow that, what's, is there some correlation between the shape of that seating area and performance, attention, and engagement. Then I think most relevant for the kind of spaces you all inhabit, one project that we've worked on, did some advising after the design got started, is the Deaf Village uh, in Dublin, Ireland. Um, they had started the project and were about um, halfway into design and thought, wait a minute, our architects aren't really understanding this idea of deaf space. Can you come help us, give us some advice of what we might do at this point? So we came in and gave a critique um, to help kind of guide the, uh, the design a little bit. By the time we were on the job, uh, the plan was already set. Um, the building is a mixed-use building. It has really three uses in it has a large recreation area for all of the community. So that's all the neighbors and everyone, both hearing and deaf. Swimming pool, major racquetball court, basketball court, uh, football patches out the back. There's a community center in the middle that has a shared auditorium, coffee shop, support spaces. And then the deaf village is uh, a local sort of deaf club where there's a social club, social services, meeting room, and a chapel. So those are kind of the primary uh, gathering spaces. Again, thinking about designing those spaces to fit that collectivist culture of the deaf community was one thing we began to want to look at. We also looked at offices, and I thought this might be uh, most relevant uh, for you guys. Um, fairly standard um, sort of office. I did layout of offices uh, for small vend uh, social service vendors, 
So they were shared offices, usually shared by one to four individuals. Um, and I, we saw kind of a couple of problems, those of daylight and how, how windows are configured relative to workstations so that you've got, uh, or seating areas. Again, having these kind of seating areas relative to windows that aren't well treated, you end up having this problem that we talked about a lot. So that's a simple change in just window treatment, roll down shades as opposed to blinds. Uh, there's also about positioning windows so that you don't have visitors uh, with light behind them. Here's a desk that's putting someone's back to the door. So there's an immediate sort of uh, surprise that happens when people enter that suite and someone's back is to the door. That's very disconcerting. Um, just as a few examples. So with that, we wanted to look at a model for an office space. How, how could you create an office space that really dealt with this interruption problem? So, you know, uh, so that for deaf people who are not seeing or who are not hearing footfall coming down the hallway or knock at the door, what they're able to do is, in this model, is we've looked at putting a band of, of wooden floor on sleepers next to the hallway, so this is the hall, that's the office. And then this is a, a vestibule, so that's an entry space. As the visitor steps onto that, there's deflection that when a person is seated, not so much standing, but that there's a, a deflection that's detected in that floor surface. There's also could be lighting that's either in this wall that's obscured glass, either at the floor or even high light so that you're sensing in a soft way that there's someone approaching. They enter the room in a peripheral vision. There's a, a blank wall to the back. That serves as a background to someone sitting here and speaking to this person. So there's not a window, there's a, in a sense a sort of stage set for a visitor to sit and have them watch them. This also allows for a peripheral vision to the outdoors, and at the same time, allowing windows and light to enter in and using that wall surface as really as a way to, to reflect or deflect light, natural light, deeper into the space. <clears throat> so we kind of took that model and tried to apply it to the best we could of what was already in place. Um, so kind of a sketch idea of how we might change, make some modifications. You can see we've introduced the vestibule kind of idea. Change some of the desks around so that they're facing forward. And you see now the path of a visitor is an extended path through a glass wall. Those occupants sense that arrival in a much more kind of friendly way rather than being surprised from the back or flashing lights. You sense them coming. And there's a kind of dignity, I think, that comes with that idea of not being interrupted by every time someone approaches your, your office space. One of the things, in a, especially in an open office plan, if you all ever in your agencies, I know some, many will have open office plans. The idea of do you seat people facing one another, as in what they originally had, or do you set them sort of in rows? In, in, in essence, in this one, people's, that person's back is to that person's face. This one, you're facing each other. We, we've looked at both. And there are, I would say, advantages and disadvantages. Currently in our office at the university, we've got two deaf employees working together. They've arranged in this way, and they use the wrap on the table as a way to get one another's attention. I know of other operations on campus where we've chosen this sort of four square so that you're always in, in someone's peripheral vision. And those are really choices about um, what is distracting versus how much access you want. So I think there again, this is a case where Two different ways work, but they're about user preference, and that's why having the user involved is so important. And finally, just looking at some ideas about the auditorium. 
the rake of the seating, having a much higher, um, steeper rake, uh, we recommend over what traditionally you might have so that you're seeing overheads and not necessarily between heads. Um, while at the same time, what we recommended, here's a pattern, the blue dots are sort of uh, visitors seated. We put, we've put individual seating so that you're staggering, so you're not only higher, but you're seeing kind of through people. And we also changed the uh, horizontal or, or uh, linear seating to a U-shaped seating. And the reason why that is, and I think, again, this goes back to a, a cultural issue. You'll notice in this seating arrangement that there are probably, we have one, two, three middle aisles. In something fairly small room, you might do away with just one. We've introduced another one to support to me, which I think is one of the, one of the greatest traditions in, in uh, deaf culture that I just love this. At the end of a presentation, or there's a kind of public speaking presentation, there's a question and answer period. So in order for everyone to see the questioner, they have to get up and walk down into the stage. So now the amount of time that that takes compared to, say, a typical kind of Q&A session, maybe two, maybe threefold over the traditional way, and there's a lot of movement and lines begin to develop at the stage. So we put in, started inserting these middle walkways as a way to have less of that time of people kind of shuffling down the long uh, sort of aisles to get to the, to the center aisle. So it's a much more friendly way to support that idea of the question and answer period that is very customary for, for the deaf community. And what I've always seen is this idea of deaf time. You know, deaf people love to sit and chat. And it's a very strong kind of cultural connection. Um, one of the things we were concerned about is the way you entered this auditorium was through very narrow hallways. And then off of those hallways were bathrooms, access to either bathrooms or stairways to other places. Meanwhile, the main gathering areas were, were at a distance. So we were concerned about people stopping and chatting and clogging up the hallways and not making their way to the, to the gathering areas. So with that, um, we changed really the access route into the rooms to guide people to, to more comfortable areas to gather in the larger rooms off ante rooms off to the side of the auditorium. Furniture was arranged originally using horizontal um, couches in that main atrium space with no regard whatsoever of visual connectivity and what it is to gather with a, uh, a visual conversation. So we began to look at kind of tuning out some diagrams around creating spaces conversation spaces within that um, main atrium that really reinforce that kind of circular or triangular conversation pattern. And then we use that as a place to where we might place skylights. So we reinforce that with a natural lighting strategy to, to take that idea of light and coordinate that with where conversations are had. And we even got in and sort of re looked at furniture arrangements within the deaf club. This is a, a pub where they play cards and drink a lot of beer um, and looked at how seating might take place in a banquette seating that allowed people to have the protection of the wall behind them. And even if their, their partners are seated at this table, on this surface are old photographs with a slightly reflective glass so they'll be able to read patterns of movement behind them, even though they're kind of facing toward the wall. So I'll just end on this idea of color and culture. Um, in Ireland, the colors are, are extremely vivid uh, color palette. While the skies are gray, there's a, a real uh, sort of extraordinarily distinctive color palette that we look to, to begin to define, to bring that idea of of the Irish culture into the facility, uh, we looked at the ways in which color already inherently was used for wayfinding. This idea of the way in which the community already used color to define entryways to houses, and we applied that to, um, 
to the floor pattern, looking at uh, gathering areas, so the, the way that the floor patterns were done, the wood or the orange became gathering areas. So all the gathering areas where people would collect and be together was a warm wood or a basketball court, for instance. Uh, the nodes or gathering areas, the important areas where you make a decision about wayfinding would be in a red, or in the, signified by the red, private spaces, and others have other coding. But using color in a way to help reinforce that awareness, visual awareness inside was really a, a driver for organizing uh, the building. So I think that, that takes you, I think, across the whole panacea of what we're, what we're thinking about from beginning to kind of uh, little details of a piece of wood. Um, so hopefully I haven't uh, taken up all the time. If there's any questions, certainly happy to answer those. Do you find uh, the principles you've learned have helped uh, generally in being an architect? They've completely transformed how I see designing a building. Not only in terms of just the, the design ideas, but how you go about thinking about buildings. Um, architects, myself included, we've all been trained to think about the concept first, that high level abstract idea that organizes all of these spaces into some kind of coherent building. That's like usually the first thing we're worried about. This, I'm actually kind of this kind of flips that paradigm on its head and it says really the first thing one should be concerned about is the occupants. Two people sort of together having a conversation, a group of people in a room, get that figured out kind of first, understand the occupant and their needs first, and then radiate out from that. And I think <clears throat> that has a very different kind of outcome I think as a building than what we traditionally have learned as architects. So, for me, it's it's very impactful. Uh, in particular, uh, to emphasize what you said, um, I was particularly drawn by uh, the uh, architecture firm in Ireland, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, launched out to you to get design ideas right. that you consult on their project. Yeah. It was, I think that emphasizes what you were saying. I, it, it does, and I, I think we're, so at Gallaudet, we're trying to take that um, the next step. We've, uh, we're redesigning a new campus gateway uh, to the campus, and the way we want to do that is engage world-class architects. So we've done a design competition that we've advertised for uh, architects from all around the world to come be a part of this. Um, so that gives us now a stage to start to share that so that they start to have that experience through, through the work that we're doing here. So <clears throat> you have your, um, I, don't know the, I don't know if they're breakdown of guidelines, standards, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Share versus what things might be unique to what you're talking right, about. Right, right. We're that's exactly what we're our next step that we're getting underway with. I think, in a lot of ways, we're I think onto something unique here. So what we're doing uh, right now at the university is we've just established the Deaf Space Institute, which will give us a body to attract funding for significant research to answer that very question. That's the long-term view. Short-term, we have started to do that. Um, we're uh, looking, what we'd love to do is begin to get some of these ideas into, say, the new well building standards that are out. Um, we're talking to other institutions who are preparing some uh, universal design standards, such as University of Buffalo, um, and looking at, at just trying to match them up and, and what works, what doesn't work. Um, I sit on the ANSI uh, Accessibility Standards Committee. Uh, this year we've been able to get a number of standards embedded into ANSI. I think that's a good first step toward beginning to insert a lot of this into the ADA, ADAG, because there simply is not really anything in ADAG. There's, you know, there's a scant few issues around communication access 
around emergency communication, that kind of thing. But really, the idea that you might shape a room in a particular way, that's just not there. So um, I think generally, uh, we see that death space principles are just good design. You know? And I think over time, I think you'll see them less and less identified. You'll really see some of these ideas less identified with deaf experience. But what will happen is, through that, I think deaf people will begin to be, we'll see more of them entering into the architecture field, uh, design, product design, because there really is a kind of sensitivity here that I think is, is what we're pushing. I, I just felt from seeing some of the things that you had, there were things that would benefit people across the spectrum. You were creating a lot of things that had intuitive use, right. that had environmental cueing. Yep. Um, that would work for uh, people with visual disabilities, people with hearing disabilities, people right. with cognitive disabilities, right. um, to help them orient in the space right. without a map, without having to have somebody explain to them where they were going and what they were doing. Right. Yeah, I think one of the, um, the whole kind of perceptual realm of having perceptually quiet spaces for people, say, with Alzheimer's or dementia uh, or aging populations is I think there's a lot of overlap there. Um, and I think deaf-blind is an area we're get, really getting into pretty actively, uh, largely out of necessity on the campus. Um, there are some inherent contradictions there um, between deaf and blind. You know, we blind or deaf space tends to want to promote flexibility a lot, say, because, you know, you want to have that dimension of the seating. I go back to that a little bit. Well, that means you have really flexible seating areas. Blind people tend to want to have really predictable space and want to know, okay, I've mapped this space. I know that seating arrangement's there and there. It'll be that way tomorrow. Um, so one, one of the things we're looking at there is mapping the campus with material that will signify predictable versus unpredictable space. So that, okay, I'm entering, you know, you, if you're a cane user, you'll come into a space where now I've detected carpet. There's the threshold. There's the carpet. Okay, this is going to be a little different today. But you don't, you don't just depend on that space always being the same. Hallway, on the other hand, or certain areas within, even within gathering spaces, would be, tend to be a hard surface, and that would be predictable. So. Mm -hmm. one, you'll draw down shades, et cetera, maybe lines. We have meetings in here, and now we're wondering about these windows. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have recommendations? <coughs> like, I prefer less distraction, you know, in a meeting, and so not being able to see everything that's going mm -hmm. on. We're just so exposed in here. We're just wide open to anybody that walks by in this hallway. Um, and sometimes we get into some heated discussions, so I'm wondering, yeah, right. you know, and other people like it open, so what's the halfway there? Well, <clears throat> over these, for sure, we, uh, a Mako shade, which is a roll-down shade that can have levels of opacity. Again, you can have like a 50, 60, 70 percent of sun. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes, and, or loose um, and those are very nice because they tend to just diffuse light and not completely block it out. The thing that's important about light to remember is what works against you is high contrast. So between dark and light, that's what you see in these. That, that line is a high contrast to that. So that's what you don't want to do. So if you're using roll down blinds, you want to make sure that you get some overlap so you don't have a line of light coming off the edge. So you want to make sure that the, the, the shade is overlapping the window. A lot of times I get them too short or try to set them within an inset. So you always get this line, really high, con bright line. And that can actually even be more distracting than if you never even pulled it, pulled it down. Um, for those, I could imagine, you know, if I was wondering if we use a, a film a lot of times that will actually just apply a film that provides a kind of a muted opacity, so you still sense movement, 
Uh, if you want people to see into the space, then the roll down, you can get Meco shades comes in in different lengths, so you could probably get some long, wide enough to, to do one there. That's a door, um, you know, so you may not want a shade in front of an emergency exit, but you might use the, the, the film might work there. And the other thing, too, is you don't have to, the film, people get stuck in this idea. You gotta, you, you'd have to apply the film to the whole piece of glass, but you don't really, because there's, there's a kind of signing zone that you could apply the, the glass or the film to as well. Yep. I'm wondering, uh, if, in fact, I just went to a PCRI B conference and um, actually sent an email back, kind of did some research, you know, here, uh, here are some suggestions of what our standards should be for reading mm. mm. room. Do you have any uh, imprint um, or uh, standards that you help? We have um, one of the ANSI standards we just got approved that'll be in the, in the next generation of ANSI will be for interpreter stations. Um, it's a first stab at it, so it may not quite be there, but at least we got it in. Um, we'll, we'll establish a location and lighting conditions and background conditions for interpreters on a public stage. And um, so I think that, that will go a long way to help. You know, I think being mindful of where a podium is, and if you have a signer that may be a podium, you don't even want a podium. I think there's, um, there's those kinds of issues. There's, um, you know, some of the, the scale of the space. You know, you get into these big conferences, and they put so much distance between the podium and that first row of seats. Or, you know, I, I think it almost feels like it's something one could actually write a a guidelines for, of considerations, you know. Uh, you, absolutely, you absolutely could do that. Um, they're all interconnected, that's the thing, you know. It's like what that distance is between that first row of seat and how high the stage is and, um, and where the interpreter stands. All of those, you'd want to kind of talk through algorithms for that. Um, but the interpreter station is one we know very a lot about. Blind, and I, had, uh, I was talking with people at the Helen Keller Institute, and they were talking about for fire alarms as mm -hmm. an issue. When somebody's deaf blind, they can't see a fire alarm going off light, you know, so they have to have feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm sure that impacts a lot of what you do, right? The population. Yeah, you know, that's, um, there are certainly now devices, you know, there are, there are wrist devices that uh, we've seen people use that are much like the health monitoring devices. Um, there are emergency warning systems, uh, there are bed shakers, like our new dormitory uh, is wired so that uh, students have the option of providing their own bed shaker, because <clears throat> even, even for sighted blind people, <clears throat> Studies have been done that shows that strobes, you know, the, these really bright strobes that are required, that one right there, um, when sleeping, uh, they really only about 20, 30 percent of, about 20 or 30 percent of people don't respond to those when they're asleep. So that's a huge amount of people. Um, so the idea of the bed shaker is something that, you know, we certainly encourage all our students to plug into. <clears throat> into the hard wire. We've got the, the power supply next to the beds where you can plug in the bed shaker has a, is connected to the fire alarm system. So if the fire alarm goes off, a signal sent through that power line and then that alarms the, the bed. And those, you know, the bed shakers can also be used just to wake you up in the morning too. It can be your alarm clock as well. Um, <clears throat> But deafblind is a really interesting place to be in because it's so 
multi-sense, there's other senses like, you know, olfactory senses and so on that we're looking at in terms of, that's definitely a known strategy for wayfinding. So having different scents of, you know, different herbs and so on and so forth um, are another means of just olfactory sensations. Um, and <clears throat> mapping space, knowing, um, you know, just textures. I think, I think there's so much more information that can be read tactilely than people have ever, than any of us have ever thought of. You know, you really become aware of that through the deafblind community. You talked about Galdet's plan for the new gateway and competition. Uh huh. You know, if we had more time, I'd show you a video from that. Um, the um, what we did is we've we've set up a couple of workshops um, that where all the four teams will come in and have a full day of working with deaf and deaf blind. And uh, one of the really interesting activities we had is um, with the deaf blind people. A lot of um, learning in terms of just getting to understand uh, hands-on communication or what is also more and more becoming pro-tactile communication is this idea of making something. So the activity is you take Play-Doh, right? And you take a, a formed piece of Play-Doh and then you're going to make something with it. So it's about the, the person, the deaf-blind person's needing the material, making something, but the other person who's learning how to read the communication hands-on is just feeling their way through that. Their hand is on the person working. So then you're making and shaping something purely with somebody, but purely tactily. There's not a visual or an auditory kind of communication happening there. So we brought the architects through, through that experience, and it, I think that had a profound impact on how they see work themselves. Uh, one good example, um, this is all top secret, uh, so I shouldn't be saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, one of the teams uh, had this, came back with this extraordinary idea for how to shape walls so that you could, get, you could be guided to the light switch or you could be guided to, you know, it could be the pot on the stove or whatever, but use it, starting to think about the shape and texture of a wall as a, as a guiding mechanism to specific targets. You know, that's pretty neat stuff. Do, do you have any other suggestions um, with regard to configuring a classroom? So I, I work with the adults and students of all different kinds of abilities. Uh -huh. Well, um, so, you know, I would suggest furniture, above all, furniture that can be the most flexible that you can have, because I'm sure in different activities you're moving furniture around. I didn't talk much about chairs. Um, we feel it, for, certainly for signers, having chairs that both swivel and have wheels <clears throat> are, you know, a lot of people think, oh my God, that's a nightmare in a classroom. but. It's really for ASL and to be able to have quick response to kind of monitor the conversation, being able to move quickly is, is really, I think, is an important issue as well. Um, having, you know, your, obviously your technology, your educational technology uh, monitors. We tend to be, we've gone away from many projection systems and we use these now. Their technology's gotten so and we see this in high schools for deaf people as well, where students are assigned an iPad. Their iPad can talk to the screen, you know, so you can have an interactive uh, technology through iPads now. And, um, you know, lighting. Lighting and acoustics, that's the other thing I didn't talk about, is acoustics is super important. Um, and there are some really good standards out there around keeping reverberation to an absolute minimum. Um, so that, uh, you know, that's easy to control. Carpet, soft, you know, absorptive materials in the space. Um, 
And I think lighting sources, we know a lot now about circadian rhythms and the, you know, the impacts of different colors of light impact people's uh, sort of alertness. Um, so all of those are, there's, a, the, uh, there's good standards out there for that, that going back to your question, one of the things we want to start to do is, is look at a lot of really great work being done right now in the wellness area, sort of looking at uh, health and the impact of the environment on health. I think there's a lot of good overlaps there. We, we've been borrowing from the, the wellness uh, uh, standards that have just come out, I think, the last year or two years or something like that. And you, someone had mentioned something about ANSI. What is, what is that? I'm, Excuse me, I need to say that this will be the last question. We're running over time now, and so we need to wrap up. Is that okay? Sorry. <laughs> I, I know you could go all night. I know that. Um, ANSI is the American, Stand American National Standards Institute, ANSI. And if you want to look at the accessibility standards, uh, it's called A117.1 Accessibility Standards. you find some really good stuff there. There's so much great stuff coming out now around universal design. Um, as well as, like I say, the, the new wellness ones are so fascinating because they're looking at buildings, thinking about the whole gamut of what human experience within a building. So it's not only just the building, but it's the air in the building, it's the food that's served in the building. It's, you know, it's just, it's really great how comprehensive we're starting to get with design guides. Thank you all very much for your time, Thank you so attention. Much. Thank you. Great. Oh, can you believe I've gotten here and I don't?